once again. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so I'll start again. So the lecture uh, is actually part of um, something I'm doing in the ERC project where I'm focusing actually on the non-human in African language texts. Uh, and uh, one of the non-humans is the world. So in a way I've been exploring um, representations of the world in several um, Afrophone texts. And I'm especially looking at the possibility of non-theoretical or if you like fictional texts to represent something like the world. I will be using uh, the terminology of um, a Czech philosopher called Hedanek, who speaks of non-objective realities. Uh, but I will uh, sort of develop on this theoretical aspect of it um, at the end of the lecture, because first I would like to introduce you to the book itself that I'll be speaking about. But I'm just um, prefacing um, this information in order to justify why I am actually speaking about literature in philosophy, or what is the connection between literature and philosophy, and why it is particularly pertinent, I think, for African philosophy. So the title of my presentation is Adina, Non-Objective Representation of the World in Bubakar Boris Diop's Domi Golo. Uh, and um, this is roughly the outline of my lecture. You made such a beautiful poster that I had to stick it in my presentation just for the memory of it. Um, so the outline, first of all, I would like to look at some very prominent metaphors in the novel. Metaphors that have been identified as uh, obsessive metaphors, as one scholar, Usman Ngom, calls it. It's metaphors that uh, really shape the novel, and I would like to show why they are pertinent for the representation of the world. But in order to do that, we will have to first look at uh, an issue with translation. The novel has been translated, but there is something that went seriously, uh, well, not wrong, but lost in that translation. And I don't want to come back to this cliche of uh, lost in translation. So in a way, I would like to look at uh, what went lost in the translation and of course why, and what happens with that loss. We will look at uh, different philosophical understandings of this novel, and we will see that precisely that which went lost, that which got lost, is in fact the key uh, to distinguish the, these, these understandings and to see you know, which one is relevant in which context and, and why. And I will conclude um, first by uh, saying some theoretical words about this representation of non-objective realities and that the connection of that to uh, literature. And uh, in more general, I will say something about the texts of African philosophy. So how is philosophy relating to its texts? So first of all, let's look at the metaphors. Now, the novel. Bubakar Boris Diop is a very prominent Senegalese author who somewhat followed the trajectory of Nubi Thiongo. In other words, he um, has a very glamorous career of writing in French, which was interrupted by a very strong experience for him, uh, the visit to Rwanda, uh, the sites of the Rwandan genocide. So this, this, this period for him marks a kind of change in his career. And he argues that because of the complicity of the French language in the Rwandan genocide, as he argues, because of that, he decided to start writing in his mother tongue, that is Wolof. Domigolo was the first of uh, the novels that he wrote in Wolof. There are currently two more that have followed. Uh, the original was uh, published in 2003. And uh, actually, you know, I collect all kinds of uh, books in all kinds of languages. And so quite by accident, I got this book uh, in Paris around that time. So that's, that's how I became interested in it. Now, um, it took quite a long time for the book to be translated. Uh, in fact, Bubakar Boris Diop was quite unwilling to have it translated or to translate it. But in the end, he did translate it. Uh, and he published it as Le Petit de la Guenon uh, in 2009. Now, this book is, uh, I don't have it here with me, but it's much thicker. Um, 
it is a kind of expanded version of the novel. It's not really a translation. And there is a very interesting article, uh, actually a thesis uh, and an article by um, Repinets, if you are interested. So uh, in a way, the translation was really uh, a rendition, a, an expanded version of the text. Um, the titles of uh, these two versions, Domigolo, Domigolo means the children of a monkey, and Le Petit de la Genon means the children of Genon, which is a, a special type of monkey. So in a way, the French translates quite literally uh, the, the, the Wolof title. Now, the book was translated into English. Interestingly, it was translated from the French, not from the Wolof in 2016. And there are also other translations uh, into Spanish, for instance. Um, uh, there is a, a Czech translation underway, but um, that is not yet out. Now, if you look at the English title, Domigolo, the Hidden Notebooks, you can see that uh, the translators opted for the original title. And they took the wall off to, in a way, exoticize the translation. But they also uh, opted for a kind of explanation of what the text actually is. The text is a narrative in several notebooks written by the old Giran for his uh, grandson Badu. So um, indeed, there are several notebooks. And then one of them is hidden, uh, secret. Uh, we don't get to read it, uh, but we can make some conjectures about what that notebook contains. Um, so these are the three key versions of the text. I'll be using um, the first and the last in my lecture. Um, and um, I also wanted, you, wanted to show you the cover because I think the cover actually communicates a lot. But let's maybe look at the other covers as well. So if you look at... Um, the um, Spanish translation uh, left top. You can see the monkey there sitting on a fence. Uh, another version of it, um, and by the way, I have these, uh, uh, these covers, most of them from the internet, so I don't really know if they had actual, actual uh, editions, but I assume they are actually covers of editions. I only have some of them. Um, the other Spanish translation uh, appears to have a huge tree. So it, there, is a, there is a bench, so we can assume it's basically the old man narrating to his uh, grandson. Then if you look at uh, the one in the middle um, and the one top right, they have um, the notebooks. Yeah, you can see the notebooks that have been uh, written by this old man. Um, and the one on the top, um, right also has the monkey sort of um, at the background in the contours. The French edition uh, that's bottom right is very um, prosaic, very blank. You only have the book with the title and there was also uh, this kind of cover uh, which is a, actually a strip of uh, paper wrapped around the cover with the uh, portrait of the author. Now the English um, I do have the English version here. Um, the English version has this kind of dry leaf, yeah, whatever that is supposed to mean in this context. Now, the original cover, if you look at it, I think is very, um, the most explicative, so to speak, the, the richest of all. It has the mirror, and you can see there is a man in the mirror who mm, I think has sort of ape-like features who sees himself as a white man in the mirror. So in a way, uh, the, the cover sort of betrays the content perhaps more than it should. At the same time, uh, the content is uh, much more complicated than just this kind of satirical image of um, the African trying to uh, become white or appear as white. But the mirror, the, the mirror that we see there is significant. Now, uh, as I said, Usman Ngom speaks of the mirror as an obsessive metaphor. Uh, in this uh, wonderful article uh, from 2013, he goes into the various meanings of the mirror and he shows why the novel, in fact, is sort of turning around the metaphor of the mirror as if around uh, some kind of axis. I will be looking at this notion of the axis for the, for the novel as I, as I move on. Now, he says uh, the mirrors and the reflections or the reflection in the mirror um, are expressions of a certain exploration. He says that in Wolof, Setu means to, um, to explore oneself, to search oneself. 
Setu is the wall of word for mirror. So there is that kind of obvious link between the mirror and the search, the, the, the interrogation. Um, he speaks of identitarian reflections. I think that's also significant. So all of these reflections concern the identity. They concern, if you like, identity politics as well. Um, and one thing he doesn't say, but I think needs to be mentioned, especially in view of the title of the book and also of what is in the book, is uh, the connection between mirroring and aping. So um, while Ngom does not write about aping, I think you cannot really deal with the mirror without dealing with the aping as well. Yeah? So aping, unlike the mirror, so the mirror has many functions and many roles. It can be distorted, it can be accurate, it can be menacing, it can be all kinds of things. It can be a sort of door into another world. On the other hand, aping is always a kind of mockery of that reflection. Uh, aping, uh, I'm using the English word aping, by the way, but we could speak, speak of monkeying perhaps, but uh, I think aping has that meaning in English of imitation, of mimicking. That's how I, how I mean it. So the connection between monkey and mimicking or imitation. So aping is same, but not quite. And this expression, as some of you will uh, recognize, is from uh, Homi Baba, whom I will quote in one um, next slide. Um, that's his explanation of mimicry. So in a way we can also uh, consider next to mirroring, aping, reflection, also this notion of mimicry. Now I would like to suggest that these metaphors of mirroring and aping um, can be read in two very different ways. And these very different ways lead to two completely different philosophical readings of the novel. So if you allow me, I would like to do that now. Uh, do that. Um, to do that, I will um, first. I will give you a kind of several examples of how these metaphors function in the text. Uh, I mean, there are many, many monkeys in the text, and there are also many mirrors. Uh, I will not be able to exhaust all of them, but I will look at some uh, salient ones, salient examples, and then I would like to evoke this notion of uh, colonial mimicry, which can be helpful to understand some of the meanings. First of all, um, the instances of mirror, mirroring, and aping. Uh, I have selected three. One is the story of uh, Yasin Ngai, who is a, a woman uh, who comes from Europe uh, back to her native village, so to speak. So we have this kind of classical example of the Bintu, uh, who has been somehow westernized, Europeanized, uh, perhaps um, imbued with some kind of uh, complex. Anyway, Yasin Jai's uh, greatest desire is to be white, to become a white woman. She has two children who are called Mbisin and Mbisan. Now, if you look at the names, even the names look, uh, I would say something like Ablaut or Umlaut. You see, I'm now uh, in this German environment. Um, they really look like mirror reflections or distortions of one another. And indeed, the children are like that. They have a kind of collective identity in the novel. But notice, well, this kind of missing bisan. We will see another example of it as we move on. So Bisin uh, Bisan and uh, Yasin Njai, she really wants to be a white woman and she's willing to sacrifice almost anything for that. She goes to see a diviner who asks her for several objects. Most of them actually mean some kind of imitation, chameleon and a broken mirror and uh, uh, the feathers of a parrot, things like that. And then um, he does something and suddenly she sees several women in the mirror and the the two initially women, the two women become one, and then there is this scene uh, which describes her uh, transformation. So she sees, basically, she looks in the mirror and she says, my God, how beautiful you are, my friend. How white your skin looks against that, against that black dress. How I envy you your beautiful long blonde hair and the way it falls onto your shoulders. The stranger stood behind her, gazing at her silently across the mirror. Now the diviner says, diviner or witch doctor, basically. He says, you are she, she is you. I still don't know what you are trying to say, Kamara. You are beginning to irritate me, Marie Gabrielle von Bolkowski. That's her new name. 
who can she be if not, your, if not you yourself? You are black, she's white, but you are one and the same person. So you can see the mirror is actually showing herself, but not quite, right? It's so showing the white person while she is black, although she appears white. I order you one last, one last time to look at yourself in the mirror. When she did look in, into the mirror, the woman reappeared behind her. Yasin Jai slightly moved her left hand, then lifted it up. The other one did the same. Now she had understood that the white woman standing behind her uh, in the mirror was herself. Now, this is the beginning of, uh, or rather, well, it's the beginning of the ending of uh, Yasin Jai's uh, story, which does not end well, uh, but I will not um, spoil it for you. Um, so we have this kind of transformation and we can see that looking in the mirror is actually the passage. It is, it is how uh, this transformation uh, takes place. Um, another instance is now we are moving to the monkeys now, to the aping. Um, but at the same time, we can see that there is almost like a mirror story, mirror image of Bisin and Bisan. Uh, there are the children of the monkey called Ninki and Nanka. So we can see the same procedure of changing I to A uh, to distinguish two words. Now, I have not um, a quotation from the book here. I just uh, have a little summary. Uh, again, it's a very long story, um, but let me read this. In Ninki Nanka, it's actually a whole book within the book, one of the notebooks. The eponymous she ape, the mirror image of Yasin Ndiai, deposits her two young in the courtyard of Atusek, Giran Fais Doppelgänger. So we can see that uh, Atusek is a kind of mirror image, or if you like doppelganger, of the main character, uh, Giran, Giran Fai. And then we have also these kind of mirror images of other characters, of Yasin Yai, and then her children who now are real monkeys, right? To complete the picture, Yasin's children, Bisin and Bisan, are mirrored by the two little monkeys, affectionately called Ninki and Nanka by Atusek. To start with, he thinks the monkey mother has brought back his grandchildren who together with the rest of his family have perished in the civil war. But when they turn into his, turn into his captors, he discovers their sadistic tendencies. They expel him from his house, tie him up with a rope, humiliate him and force him to start, um, uh, to starve, it should be starve, sorry, while they are living like kings. In essence, they do to Atusek as the colonizer did to Africans. So we have this very weird story of uh, two little monkeys, two monkey children, starting to live uh, in Atusek's abode in his house, using his uh, television, using his food, uh, tying him up uh, and abusing him, beating him, biting him. So we have a very, very, very strange representation of uh, domination and a very abusive relationship uh, between uh, the two monkeys and Atusek. Now, the final um, image of a mirror, and also in connection with monkeys, this time it's two gorillas, is uh, in the final part of the novel, or basically almost at the end, where we have this uh, image of two gorillas uh, slaughtering one another because they have seen themselves in the mirror. So there is that kind of con conflation between self and other through the mirror, and the gorillas become very aggressive because they see their own aggression in the mirror. And then uh, they end up both being dead. So they actually kill themselves um, um, or kill one another, I should say, uh, because of what they see in the mirrors. So we have these kind of three instances that um, significantly connect aping, imitation, actual, actual monkeys or gorillas and mirrors. And um, I would like to evoke uh, one more concept uh, for the analysis, which is that of mimicry, characterized as similarity in difference by Homi Baba. He says, um, colonial mimicry is the desire for a reformed recognizable other as a subject of a difference that is almost the same, but not quite. Yeah, this is significant. He speaks of an ironic compromise, and he also speaks of ambivalence. Mimicry must continually produce its slippage, its, its excess, its difference. So um, there is a lot of uh, sort of non-identity in that attempted identity. And what is also significant is that this kind of 
desire of a slippage actually comes from both sides. It is imposed by the colonizer, but it's somehow adopted and appropriated by the colonized. So this is, I think, important. Now, um, I'm coming to the translation. And again, I would like to say almost the same, but not quite. So what happened in the translation? Um, why are we even speaking about it? Um, I will start with, this is how the novel starts, with this short uh, text that looks like a poem and that in fact um, evokes a poem or a song, um, right? And this is my translation of this short uh, passage. The world, life, death. Now, if you look at the world, uh, the word for the world is Adina, obviously coming from Arabic. Uh, it's the same word in most um, languages or in many languages that have been influenced by Islam in Africa, in Swahili dunia. Uh, so you have uh, this kind of reference to the world, right? And then you have life, death. There is nothing else here, Badu. This only go, I'm coming. As I said this, then I understood that poet, the world has no importance, pity. Those who die lose their life, pity. Um, and again, there is something really, I think, interesting in this word, bakkan. Bakkan means life, but also knows. So in a way, it's a kind of oriented, uh, or sense of orientation, I think. So in a way, you lose your orientation if you interpret it with that other meaning. So we have this kind of, I would say, solemn, very philosophical entree of the novel. Now, in the French version, which I will quote in the English translation, so the English is actually like a verbatim translation of the French, uh, you have, instead of these few lines, you have this. Yeah, you can see it's a very different text. Now, I will not read it. It describes the uh, ritual of mourning for the dead. But what I would like to uh, point out is, if you look at the very bottom, uh, someone is drawing there, I think. If you look at the very bottom, uh, you can see that, um, you can see that uh, the line from the poem or song, um, it is actually characterized as a popular song here, um, is not translated. Now yeah, you have Adina there, but you don't really have any explanation of what it means. Um, Giran Fai only says that um, a piece of music is rising up in my memory. Um, and in a way, I would like to acknowledge um, a Swahili, uh, sorry, a SOAS student uh, who once commented on this passage that she thought it was uh, written in a kind of um, almost flirtatious tone. I mean, Giran then describes how he was chasing after women, how he was, uh, well, never shy for living life. Um, so it gave her the impression that this text was written by, um, or was basically composed by an old man who sort of remembers his, his, his better days um, with a lot of um, frivolous sort of joy, if you like. Well, I was quite surprised to hear that because for me, um, this uh, original entry, in fact, is very sad, very deep and very philosophical. It has nothing of that frivolous nature of the translation. Now, Bubakar Boris Diop has himself commented on um, the translation and he mentioned this very passage um, as something very difficult for him to translate. Um, this is what he said. The best example of the difficulty of the task that I can give is the first three words of the novel, Adina Dunde, what could be easier a priori than rendering these in French. It would be here below live die. It is easy to see that this does not mean anything. It took me nearly two pages to render something acceptably, somewhat acceptably, these three words so charged with meaning and tenderness involved, but completely fossilized and perfectly silly in French. To communicate the difficulty to render effectively the opening lines of Domigolo, I have to remember the sounds of my own childhood. Effectively, every time there was a death among the close relatives, my mother announced the news through these three simple words, Adina Dunde. It is enough to pronounce them 
of any um, Senegalese person in front of any Senegalese person, and he or she will understand, like myself back then, the silence that follows, the sudden gravity of the atmosphere in this moment when everyone seems to be reminded, even in spite of him or herself, of the derisory precariousness of human existence. So um, I sort of ironically uh, called it lost for world because what we see is lost in the translation is the world. <laughs> yeah? It is the reference to the world, which is carried through this one word, Adina. And then uh, we, in the original, we have this kind of double reference to it, Adina Dunde, and then Adina Amu Solo. Um, while in the French, we have it in the textual form. We, had, we have Adina here. But we don't know what it means, right? We just read the English or the French and we just read it as some kind of exotic line from, from a poem or a song. So what is lost here is the reference to the world. It is really the setting of the novel, which is being changed or lost. Now, Bubakar Boris Diop comments further. Um, sorry, this is um, him being quoted by uh, Nathalie Carré. Um, he says, if you translate from Italian to Spanish or from Bambara to Fulfulde, you are in the same sound universe and the cultural codes echo one another harmoniously. In this case, I had to establish correspondences between two mental worlds that are radically different, the worlds as portrayed by the Wolof and the French language. So you can see that the, the language actually mirrors completely different worlds. Now, are they really different? That's the next question. What does Adina really mean? So I'm actually coming to the philosophical part of it. If we look at the translated text, uh, I will follow mainly Gom's uh, analysis. Now, Gom was using uh, the Wolof only. Um, I, he has never, not once, actually, no, not at all, quoted the French version. But uh, so he has actually multiple meanings there, but he also interprets the mirrors um, as what he calls mimetisme servile, servile mimetism, suivisme aveugle, blind following, or a kind of followingism, right? So um, he really is, he sees the mirror as a way to um, critique the post colonial society. He says, the mirror is placed in the story to explore and reflect the profound psychological and identity crisis of Africans. So really a post-colonial setting. He says, the metaphor of the mirror uh, is a reflection of the missing personality of the post-colonized. He says, the deceitful mirror of the European therefore serves to raise the aspiration of the post slash colonized to resemble his or her master. Um, the, the English translator Wilfie Lecky also reads um, the metaphors in the same way, or in this predominantly in this way. She says that uh, the novel is a sharply critical commentary on colonization and the senseless civil wars that afflict African countries at regular intervals. And uh, she also reads a story which is actually absent from the Wolof version uh, of a baboon on the rock of Gib Gibraltar. Um, she says, here the versatile monkey is not a generic representation of the colonizer, but impersonates black Africans. So we can see that, I don't want to go into these interpretations one by one, but we can see that all of them actually involve colonization. All of them involve um, post-colonial civil wars. Um, and they also involve the perception of the colonized vis-a-vis -vis the colonizer. Now, if we now look at what went lost, if we took this word Adina seriously, and uh, this is where Ngom also has a very interesting insight, uh, we will actually arrive at a very different reading, um, not exclusive with the post-colonial one, but I think uh, much deeper or rather differently oriented. Ngom says the entire philosophy of the novel is actually based on a duplicity that is difficult to reconcile because it is a unity of contradiction. 
Now, duplicity, um, I think in French, even more than in English, means um, faking. Yeah? It means um, pretending something. So there is that kind of um, deception, perhaps is the word, treacherousness, which is uh, perhaps stronger in the French than in the English word. But even the English word, I think, carries that meaning. Um, he speaks of the entire philosophy of the novel. Now, um, actually, all of this starts with that word Adina, the world, because we need to uh, consider what that word actually means in wall of language and especially wall of culture. As I told you, it is a word that comes from the Arabic and uh, wall of culture obviously has been deeply impacted by Islam and particularly by or most of the poems, most of the songs that we see quoted in the novel are actually by Sufi poets or by singers using uh, Sufi poets. So we have this very strong presence of Sufi Islam behind the novel, as it were. Uh, Emiliano Minerba, in a recent lecture that he uh, gave on um, the Sufi wall of poetry uh, at Bayreuth, uh, speaks of dichotomies or binaries. He says reality is made of dichotomies. Um, and these binaries or dichotomies, we have to bear in mind, are always value laden. They always um, weigh to one side, right? So uh, one is better than the other, day and night, um, light and dark, things like that. Now, Adina is the place of these um, dichotomies. It is also one part of a dichotomy. It is opposed to, um, well, we saw a translation of this uh, here, here below. So basically the beyond is the other of Adina, but it's actually difficult to say it's the other because it is the truth, right? It is, the, it is that which is only one that translates, uh, sorry, transcends uh, the dichotomies in the end. Now, what does this mean for human action? What does this mean for the story? Um, this is now um, Ngom, who develops this theme of uh, dualisms, um, of the, what he calls duplicity. duplicity. Uh, he says the beginning of the novel sets the tone, Adina Dunde. Uh, in the same way, it presents Dek Ak Fen, truth and lie and opposes dem acte yesterday and today in a perpetual battle, but always favoring, right? Favoring one of these uh, uh, binaries or one side of the binaries. It also opposes the temporary and the spiritual incarnated respectively in Dawood Yang and Ustad Mbai Law. So uh, the temporary and the spiritual, again, two sides of a binary. And now in the novel and in history, actually, they are incarnated. Right? They are present as characters or as actual historical figures. Now, one significant binary, I think maybe the most significant one is that between the external appearance and the inner uh, truth. Um, now, there are many readings of this binary, of this um, dualism. Um, one looks at the external quality, one looks at interiority, uh, Zahir and Batin. Uh, these words exist in Wolof, Esahir and Batin. They reappear uh, again and again in, uh, in the poems, um, in the Sufi poems. They also appear in Swahili as Dahiri, Batini. Um, one really covers the appearance, the phenomenal level of reality, while the other um, um, looks at the insight and the insight is val valued um, as, as more true. Um, this is what Knappert says about um, the poems. This now concerns the Swahili culture, but in fact, the, the background is, is the same, uh, the background philosophy. Batini means interior esoteric. Every word of the Quran and indeed every creation of God has a double significance. One is its outer appearance, Dahiri. The other is the interior or hidden meaning disclosed only to a few philosophers and mystics whose long hours of meditation have brought them closer to the secrets of the omniscient. They are able to see every creature as an expression of divine beauty and goodness. Dahiri, by contrast, apparent, the word Dahiri denotes the opposite of Batini. Dahiri is the exterior of things and people, their outer form, which is perishable and therefore deceptive. 
So I think this is now the really critical difference. The mirror exposes first and foremost the dahiri level of reality, right? And that's the level that is being aped or mimicked. Uh, the mirror also uh, suggests there is perhaps something else, but you really need to uh, want to discover that other reality behind the mirror. Um, now, um, this duality between Zahir and Batin, Zahir, Batin, Zahiri, Batini, um, is a key quality of Adina, of the world. And it characterizes the world. It gives it its key quality, which is being deceptive, deception. We move always in the apparent, um, and it takes effort to actually transcend the apparent. So um, this kind of constant slippage of meaning uh, is an inherent quality of the world. Now, this of course also uh, has many, many possible interpretations, many readings, it gives rise to the way things signify something else. We need to interpret indeed the whole world, the whole phenomenal reality, and then we come at um, a specific form of hermeneutics as an approach to the world. Now, um, I'm putting this slide just, um, I spoke of Swahili a little bit. As you know, my background really is in Swahili culture. And uh, there is a, an excellent poem in uh, Swahili that very clearly articulates this notion of the world, um, differentiating between the uh, phenomenal qualities of the world and the, if you like, metaphysical principle or the deep nature of the world. And uh, in, in jest, the world is worthless, destructive, impermanent, and deceptive. Now, if we look back at the novel, we see that these qualities are actually reflected in, in the novel. Um, they stand behind the plot of the novel, especially the deceptive and impermanent uh, side of it. So, um, mirroring. Um, indeed in the novel, is a reflection of the apparent, but it also is a means to its interrogation. It is an access to the apparent, to the ahir, that gives you the opportunity to question it. But once you slip to the um, same but not quite, to the aping, uh, you reduce your action to the ahir, uh, to the apparent. So, um, Aping really is a kind of devalued uh, way of mirroring. We could say that even there, there is that duality between one good way of mirroring and one bad way. Now, both of these, however, reflect a deeper metaphysical quality of the world, world, not just the effect of colonialism. Once you have this background of uh, everything happening in Adina, in the world here below, so colonial mimicry then is just an instance of this constitution of Adina. So what I mean to say is that if you stick to the colonial, post-colonial reading of the novel, you are really missing out on this deep metaphysical level which it actually touches in the way it structures the world and presents the world. And this is, I think, a really critical point uh, because then you, you are in a way stuck with a very shallow history, the history of colonialism. You are stuck with um, interpreting things, events, parts of the plot and so on, and actually actual history as well, as being assembled um, around the Axis metropole colony. So you really interpret almost everything with a very sort of geographically and um, historically limited um, framework of um, interpretation. Now, I think that once you actually take this Adina seriously, um, and you must do it through the original, there is no way to access that level through the translation, uh, you in fact have a very uh, profound study of the metaphysical setup of the world in the novel. History and politics stay on the level of the apparent, they are 
a manifestation, a mere manifestation of that deep nature of the universe. People are embodiments of these um, binary structures that actually derive from the metaphysical uh, quality of the world. So um, my last point or my last um, aspect of the analysis would be to look at how the novel actually signifies Adina, signifies the world. Um, if we look at the text, um, we can see that um, the world appears on the textual level in the beginning, in the opening passage. It appears, um, yeah, it appears through the words, it's actually described. So you can say it's in focus, it is the object of description, but it continues uh, being present throughout the novel um, as the setting. And it also continues being present through structural reminders. So for instance, this kind of um, falling apart of the novel into dualisms. And it also continues being present through intertextual reminders there are uh, a number of textual references to uh, Sufi poets, philosophers, um, singers, um, writers, filmmakers, and so on, all of whom, um, I mean, you need to really know the cultural level and you need to, uh, in some instances, know also Wolof in order to uh, actually decode these intertextual uh, references. So um, in sum, we have the introduction of the world as an object, and then it sort of becomes the setting of the plot. And you are continually reminded of it through these uh, various uh, reminders and references. But you must be um, sensitive to them. You must actually know how to decode these references. The world, as I have argued, constitutes what I would call a kind of semiotic axis or uh, orientation of the novel. It makes things meaningful. Yeah, one character being part of a binary has such and such qualities, the other has other qualities. They embody certain qualities of uh, reality as we know it from the world. Um, and uh, of course, there is a very clear orientation of the world, uh, as I um, showed you in that little reference to the Swahili poem, the world is actually connotated very negatively. So you have to bear in mind that the world is full of deception, everything can be um, deceptive, everything has to be interrogated with suspicion because deception is an omnipresent quality of the world. The world is destructive, the world is impermanent and so on. Now, if you read the novel in a European language, I would argue you read something which has been dislocated culturally and philosophically. And indeed you read it, as I suggest, as this kind of statement on post-colonial African society, which is nevertheless, of course, very pertinent and a very interesting, um, I think it's a beautiful novel, but you are in a way missing, missing out on these deeper levels, particularly for philosophers. I think these deeper levels are the ones that, that matter. Um, now, if we say the novel keeps or, or puts the world in focus, keeps it in focus for a while, and then lets it um, sort of get lost as, 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 as an object and um, maintains it in a different way as, as a setting, let's call it setting. What is happening there? I'm now coming to um, this uh, theoretical part of um, my presentation, which will really be the concluding one or the one before the concluding one. Um, so what is the world as a reality? Um, what is this notion of non-objective realities? Why am I evo evoking it? Um, I took the concept from um, Heidanek, from a philosopher who was basically, he was a kind of uh, heir of uh, phenomenology and of the Czech reception of phenomenology as well. And he um, established that there are certain problems with the classical understanding of phenomenology and of the intention as objectifying um, uh, things, objectifying reality. Um, 
this was particularly important, I think, for several reasons, because in the time when Heydanek lived, which was, um, so he was most active um, in the second half of the 20th century under the communist regime, of course, notions such as humanity, uh, truth, freedom, uh, became really the key concepts of uh, dissident thought. So the kind of non-mainstream philosophical thought in, um, in the Eastern Bloc countries. Now, for Heydanek, this notion of non-objective realities was a way to access these um, notions and to speak about them philosophically. Now, he says that um, they expose the limits of conceptual thought, conceptual thought meaning uh, the objectifying thought, the thought that places things in focus. He says, not only traditional sciences, but also traditional ways of philosophical thought are unable to deal with these themes with methodological rigor. And consequently, because they are hampered by the traditional conceptual repertoire or equipment, which consists in a fixed and mutual link of each concept with its intentional object. Um, sorry, I think I did not. Yeah, no, sorry, I, I read it wrongly. So because is a, yeah. So basically he, um, um, analyzes the way um, the, the, the concept, which is the way you conceive of the object in your mind is linked to something outside. Um, this kind of structure of um, perceiving and objectifying makes it impossible to um, relate to uh, the realities that are listed above. Now he says further that, for instance, the world as a whole is not an object and any attempt to comprehend it as an object and that precisely means an attempt to model it in thought as an object of intention is false. He also speaks of humanity. He says an objectifying understanding of the human being as an object of sorts is dehumanizing, anthropologically unacceptable and immoral in relationships between humans. He also speaks of truth. He says truth is not a thing among things. It is not an object among other objects, but pure non-objectivity, which appears to objectifying thinking as nothing, as nihil. Now, of course, these notions were politically extremely um, heavy for him and very important. But I think what he says about um, the representation, about the objectifying representation of these realities uh, is now very pertinent to our topic. So of course we have the world, you can never see the world. You can never have the world in front of you as an object. So how do you relate to the world? How do you study it philosophically? How do you represent it in uh, your limited means of um, representation, that is language and text? Now, I think um, it is literature that comes to help here in very uh, significant ways. And let me explain how. I mean, if we, this is a kind of basic list of narrative techniques. We see that uh, literature uses setting, plot, point of view, style, theme, character. These are sort of factors or if you like vectors of um, the way literature shapes its message. And of course they are quite different from the way uh, non-fictional prose uh, approaches things. Um, you can represent a lot of things in literature without really representing them. So in that kind of indirect, uh, non-objectifying way. So my concluding uh, question or suggestion would be that um, literature, in fact, has quite a lot to say on philosophical topics. And one such topic would be some of these non-objective realities, truth, humanity, the world, freedom, and so on. It does it in a different way than non-objective prose, but I would say it's not less philosophical because of these uh, specific qualities of literary genres. Now, um, to conclude, in the lecture, I have tried to look at the philosophical concept of Adina as the world through a literary text. So it is a representation of the world um, developed um, in a text which is a novel, basically. It is not a philosophical, uh, philosophical, if you like, a treatise. Uh, it is a text in Wolof with a lot of um, 
resonances in um, other languages, other cultures, other texts. Uh, the text actually um, is placed within a number of intellectual continuities in Africa. Again, these are continuities that may be quite difficult to establish for um, non-fictional writing of African philosophy as we see it these days. The continuities are historical. So you can see um, a historical connection uh, through the influence of Islam. We can speak of the connection between um, East African Islam um, uh, present in al Inkishafi, for instance. The poem is from um, the year 1800, roughly. Uh, there is a similar body of writing in West Africa as well. Uh, a lot of poems, uh, a lot of uh, ancient manuscripts. Um, some of them have now been um, if you like discovered or uh, described in uh, the so-called Timbuktu studies. We see a lot of continuities also geographically. So we see that kind of uh, long link between West African and East African intellectual uh, traditions. Uh, we can also see uh, connections uh, that are linguistic. Now I have pursued the connection between Wolof and English. But I could equally say there is also that connection that goes to Arabic and that goes to Swahili and a number of other languages. Uh, so the, the novel really opens these doors for uh, exploration. Uh, we need to question the way, the specific way the novel deals with the philosophical topic of the world. Of course, we need to account for the expressive repertoire of the genre of the novel, and I mentioned some of them, the narrative techniques. We also need to um, interrogate the whole notion of fictionality. Um, yeah, and uh, finally, I would suggest that literature uh, can be literature. I don't like the word literature. That's why I put it in quotation marks, because of course, it's a very culturally loaded term. Sometimes it's better to say just texts. But in this case, I think it's clear we are, what we are speaking about, right? Um, uh, literature in Wolof. So uh, literature in a way offers um, a possibility to explore the representation of these so-called non-objective realities uh, that conceptual thought, theoretical non-fictional thought, basically or prose, if you like, uh, struggles with. And uh, that's my conclusion. Thank you so much. We have a, like a blue crocodile, I think. Someone has drawn a crocodile on the left bottom corner. <laughs> Hi, crocodile. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very, uh, very interesting. Um, thank you so much. Uh, very yeah. Nice. yeah. Thank you so much. It's, it's interesting how a single novel will have um, so much topics packed within. It, um, uh, post-coloniality, identity issues, authority issues, mimicry, difference, ontology, um, uh, just basically reiterating how much philosophy depends on uh, what in your in in your word text, not what, literature text. Um, another another day for um, discussing about which which is more better to use literature or text. Um, uh, I will now hand over to Bian to uh, lead the comment and question session. Thank you very much, Elvis. And I see there's already some excitement growing here. That's very nice. Um, yes, Miyabulo, I would like you to uh, unmute yourself. Um, if you feel uh, that you can do that, start your camera and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and time I'm given. Very, very interesting uh, talk, very interesting uh, session I had. Um, the question I have of which when I read um, or when I listen to, to, to this interesting talk, I, I'm, I'm um, reminded of, or I find a link with certain philosophers in the field from Martin Heidegger speaking about this in, in being in time, uh, being in the world, and uh, moving to thinkers like um, Bruce Yans, speaking about philosophy and class, and all those thinkers who, who prioritize and take seriously context. So 
am I just um, connecting things that are are not uh, worthy to connect according to 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 the speaker? You see, does he find the same connection with his thinkers? Because he even speak about African philosophy. And African philosophy it's a, a philosophy that seeks to reflect a philosophy that is contextual, um, that is not based on that is an objective sense of reality in the world. Uh, that was mischaracterized by thinkers like their cut uh, and some thinkers of the enlightened. Thank you very much. I, I hope my question was clear. I'll... Thank you. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking if there is a connection between thinkers like Heidegger and um, and the novel. Hmm. Is that is that so? It's, it's, it's partly like that. Uh, but I think it's the way you understood it. Maybe I can rephrase it. Maybe you can com 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 complement uh, the question as I as I speak. Um, yes. So. Um, I would say not in the novel. <laughs> I would say the novel um, the novel does not reference, um, I'm trying to think, I, I don't think it references any Western philosophers, the novel itself. The connection would be through my interpretation of the non-objective realities. So Heidanek obviously uh, was influenced by Husserl, um, Husserl, in a way, started interrogating this kind of Lebenswelt, as he called it, the life world. And then, of course, that, that notion sort of trickled down into the work of uh, several philosophers, uh, such as Jan Patochka, who was also a Czech philosopher, a friend of Heida next. So in, there is that line going from uh, Husserl, Heidegger, and uh, the other uh, thinkers of the 20th century going to um, to Heidanek and to that interpretation of the non-objective realities. But as for the novel, I think it is based on a completely different philosophical uh, presuppositions altogether. And uh, if you like, um, the philosophy it is built on is really um, largely derived from um, Sufism. So it is really based on the Sufi notion of the world and uh, of the human being as um, being in a way tempted by the world as having to go through the world uh, to reach beyond the world. So in a way, this kind of uh, understanding of the world in my, in my reading of it actually is the axis around which the whole novel sort of moves or um, it makes sense around that axis. By the way, Soas has a subscription to the novel. It is on JSTOR, or at least it was when I when I uh, when I was at Soas. So I think you can all read it, and I think it is really worthwhile. It is worth reading. It's one of the I think richest novels. Well, it's not. There are so many rich novels, but uh, I'm just currently finding it very, very rich and multifaceted. I'm not sure if I answered the question uh, totally. You also mentioned the kind of contextual philosophy, um, or maybe you are referring to the kind of Ubuntu trend of philosophy. I would say that is not present in the novel. That is not, um, not it is not really. part. <clears throat> not really, not really. No? I think- um, Okay, so I misunderstood you then. Uh, the, when I'm speaking about context, I'm speaking about, <clears throat> uh, when you speak about this kind of uh, mirroring or AP, an aping, it's a mimicry, as you uh, pointed uh. out. Uh, it's someone who's um, reflecting a context that is not stationed in, in my view. Because when I, I mimic you, that means I'm just uh, suspending myself from where I'm stationed within uh, myself uh -huh. and in relation and being cognizant of the context I'm in and jump and move to another context and take it as it is without being there and imbibing it or making it my own reality. So that's what I was trying to, 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 to point out in terms of context, not that uh, when you speak about of African context, there's, there's Ubuntu, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that because Ubuntu is also a contextual and, uh -huh. and uh -huh. a, a, a view or a mode of thought of a particular epoch of history. Uh -huh. And we are trying to make it viable in the here and now in a new uh, or in a, in a contemporary, contemporary context. So that's what I was trying to, to, to show. Because these thinkers I'm, I mean, I'm speaking about, like Martin Heidegger, they say being there, being in a place. So mimicry emanates in my understanding from the fact that someone is um, 
viewing the other and trying to be in the context of the other while he's not there physically. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I'm, I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's very interesting. Thanks for that. I mean, I, I think you basically expressed it very well. Um, and definitely that would apply to uh, this type of mimicry would apply to the novel because of course, for instance, uh, Yasin Yai, this character who wanted to become white, yeah, she basically experienced something in France, then she came back to Senegal and she was unable to reintegrate herself in that context. So in a way she sort of mimicked uh, uh, the way of being a white woman, even through the name that she chose. So definitely that would be that would be there, and I think um, you know maybe maybe that will be a task for you to interpret the novel through Heidegger or put him and put um, Heidegger in connection with the novel. I think that would again be very very interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, thank you very much, Nyabolo. And uh, the next question would be from Sean. Hi, Elena. I. I'm just, um, I don't even know where to begin because everything that you said was just like sparking so many ideas and so many kind of connections. And um, I have quite quite a lot to say back to you, but also just sort of, I'm, I'm very curious about so much of what you said. And of course, as you will know, as soon as you start talking about mirroring, what do I think about? I think about Lacan mm -hmm. and I think about how he, um, suggests that as we come into understanding that we are an autonomous person, we see ourselves in a mirror image, but what we see in the image is an other, but we mistake that other for ourselves. So we are always split between an other who is not us and a, a kind of nothing that almost identifies with this other that seems coherent and clear in the image, which then of course connects to mimicry in the context of the colonized um, subject. And that kind of sense of duplicity as I think you brought out beautifully was that the anxiety of the colonizing subject is the duplicity of the mimic man as, as, as Baba uh, turns out. But of course, what that doesn't really account for is the agony of the colonized subject who has no option mm -hmm. in such a context, but to perform that kind of mirroring image without any of the gratification that Lacan says one achieves mm -hmm. in, in that, that mirror state, right? So I think, you know, what you're showing is that it brings into relief the position of the colonized um subject who uh, and, and which again of course recalls Fanon right who is forced to encounter mm -hmm. the gaze of the colonized uh, colonizer uh, at a point up until which he has identified himself entirely with the colonizer so he's shocked to hear himself referred to with the n-word on a train by this child who is suddenly frightened of him and he has to sort of come to terms with his own hatred of his own body and that that image in the book cover uh the first the first one you know of the um the the man sitting in front of the mirror seeing the ape and that kind of play on the sense of ape is is like so profound so economically profound. So I thought that, you know, that's mm -hmm. wonderful and, and, and so kind of, um, what would I say, transformative in, of my reading of Lacan. However, when it comes to this issue of Adine, uh, Adine, Adina, sorry, mm -hmm. um, and the Dun and Di, and then the connection to, to Sufism, my issue there, is that Sufism is, at least in the context that I'm most familiar with, which is more the kind of Indian subcontinent Pakistan, uh, Sufism in that context is actually the preferred Islam, right, for the colonizing power. And when it reads as, as life and uh, or live and die in Urdu, I would read that as dunya and deen. Right, so dunya 
is just the kind of natural world. Whereas Deen is what always gets translated in English as religion. And yet it's a complete distortion of what is meant by that um, term, which is that more kind of metaphysical life world, but also one's social obligations, one's debts, uh, who one has kinship networks with. It's the world of the social, whereas dunya is the kind of um, natural world. And because Sufism is this kind of preferred Islamic other, I wonder how that's playing out in, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of good Islam, right? Because it's, just, it's kind of mystical and it's not really kind of engaging in this worldly activities. And I'm kind of wondering um, from your point of view, whether it's the same, I mean, is it playing out in the same way? Is it this kind of um, colonizing force that makes Sufism this preferred other? Or is there a kind of deeper history there that's not in any way kind of tangled up with that colonizing impetus that says you're allowed to be religious as long as it's this otherworldly thing that really has nothing to say about the world of politics or social relationships or, or things like that. Sorry, very long-winded, but just... Gosh, I was just like writing away and thinking so, so much as you were talking. So thank you. Loved it. Thank you so much. Um, these are fascinating questions, actually. I, you know, curiously enough, I never thought of Laka when I was um, preparing this paper. <clears throat> and I just keep asking myself why. <laughs> um, I would say maybe, um, you know, I think there are so many possibilities to actually read and reread the novel you know, with Heidegger, with Lacan, perhaps. What I was trying to do in the paper was to read the mirror from within that Sufi philosophy background. Yeah, so in a way, I think I, I sort of consciously shied away from European philosophers until that kind of non-objective um, concept, which I borrowed from Heidanek. But um, that said, I think that uh, there are so many ways to interpret it. And I think what you said, you know, it would be a paper in itself, a wonderful paper that would connect um, to that mimicry strand of, uh, of my talk. Now about the Sufi uh, Islam as being the good Islam, I must say, from what I know, this is not the case. In Senegal, there are four Sufi orders. So in a way, it is, the, it is a very prominent part of Islam. Uh, as for East Africa, I would say it is less prominent, but very present, especially in poetry. Uh, but I would not necessarily see it as somehow preferred or backed up by colonialism. Um, I'm, from what I know, at least, you know, I'm not a kind of expert on the um, sociology of religion. But the words that you mentioned from Urdu, they of course also exist in, in African languages. In Swahili, you have dunia and dini for the, two, for the two notions that you mentioned. So I completely understand what you mean by, by that um, uh, dualism, by that distinction. Um, so my answer would be, I don't really see that kind of uh, colonial push behind Sufism. Uh, either in the novel or in Senegalese society as such, from what I know at least. And certainly not in the East African coast. I think that's even there, the Sufism is even less prominent as a, as a religious option, so to speak. Can I just sort of come back on that? I think, um, yeah, I, I of course accept that. I think, you know, what's interesting about what you're, you're pointing to is this kind of unifying notion of Adina. No, as not actually having to separate those two things mm -hmm. out so much as we would do in that kind of in, in colonial modernity, right, which is, the, which is the foundation of the nation state where, you know, the, the profane and the sacred, mm -hmm. so to speak, right, so that becomes the kind of organizing motif for, for colonial um, modernity. But I mean, I think with respect to the issue of mirroring, um, I think, you know, what, what's very helpful about the novel and, and the novel as philosophical text, and I, that was a disciple of Derrida, obviously, I, I think, <laughs> duh. Um, I think you know, what, what's really helpful about what you're pointing out here um, is, is the gift of the other to, it, it, in giving the self, it's self, you know, and, 
and the self in its very many different manifestations mm -hmm. which i think your command um happens in that particular mm -hmm. novel even in the kind of clever mirroring of the various different characters you've got um a sense that one is not a self unless the other gives this gift it might be a hostile gift but it's a gift mm -hmm. nonetheless and i think that's what i take from lacan but I think with what we find in Lacan is that Lacan never acknowledges his debts yeah. to the others from whom he's taking yeah. these yeah. ideas, which are largely colonized subject. We have to think of uh, France's relationship to Algeria, but we also know that Lacan is very interested yeah. in Sanskrit thought and the kind of non-dualism that you find there and, and so on. So I think you know there's no need to reference Lacan but actually there's a work to do there which is to track the genealogy yeah. whereby mm -hmm. he is almost um appropriating the yeah. ideas of the other in order to create a philosophy which suggests that the other gives us who we are oh the irony mm. anyway i'll leave it there but thank you a fantastic paper fascinating thank you <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that rich discussion. Um, and then I would like to invite Leah to ask the next question. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, I have a couple of one question and, and, and a comment. Um, I agree with the, the person who said something about Heidegger, because Heidegger, I think, also does not see truth as representation, but as disclosure and as hermeneutics, as as seeing that not exactly what is there, but you have to, to yeah. dig beyond it and all that. So I yeah. think that's already there and that's interesting the way he does it. I just wondered about this esoteric and exoteric. Are you looking at a um, metaphor as a, as a um, um, symbol? Because you know, in Henri Corbin, who, is, who, who did a lot of stuff on uh, Persian Sufism, Ibn Arabi mostly, um, for him, symbol is the outside is very much attached, you know, that is a fight with Heidegger. The phenomena, you cannot drop the phenomena and extract something from it. You know, that's like philosophy or whatever. And the novel fits very well against it, I think nicely. Because once you extract, you know, you, you leave the phenomena completely and you are in the world of concept and whatever, which are not covered what we really want to cover. So the phenomena holds it, but it's not, um, it's not uh, something distorted. It's not, um, the exoteric is not false. It's not like the, something is false about it. It hides the esoteric and it works kind of together. And I wondered if with regard to the novel, isn't there a problem like in art generally that the, that is maybe, I don't know, maybe it's different than philosophy, that the form is part of the content, that you cannot really take, um, you know, that the, the, the novel itself as it is, you know, it's like Borges, the, the, the guy who wanted to rewrite Don Quixote, <laughs> and the only way to rewrite Don Quixote was to rewrite Don Quixote. You can't write it differently because the novel by itself is what it is. The minute we try to extract from it, that's how we get into philosophy, it's something different. I just wonder about it. Sorry. Hello, can you? I'm yes, sorry. Please, I, I yeah, there, there was a little hiccup, but we can see yeah. you now. I, I did not hear the rest of the question. I heard you said something about a symbol and. Ah, uh, no, I said that the novel. Um, because it's art, I think that's the difference between art maybe and philosophy, the form itself, like the novel, is also part of the content. If you start, you know, uh, dissecting it, you know, and saying what it says and what it means and whatever, you get to, into philosophy, but you, you, you lose the whole uh, content. And it's a problem with language, I think. Anyhow, you cannot, you cannot do esoteric in language because it's so singular, the esoteric. It's, you can only do exoteric kind of. So how do you deal with it when you do novel versus philosophy or you do, how do you get to the esoteric? How do you say the unsayable, so to speak? That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That, that's very, very rich. Um, a, lot, a lot of things to think about. Well, I, I don't do, I don't say the unsayable. <laughs> You know, I, I see again. I see it as a thing, as a as a as an issue of genre. In a way, the novel is a genre. My paper is a different genre, 
So I use a different way of speaking about reality. And of course, I cannot just read the novel to you. I would not give you anything. I need to, in a way, destroy its novelness. I need to, yeah, I analyze it, which means I also give something of my own ideas. I put, put it in different contexts. So it's a pity, but unfortunately, to get the novel, you need to read it. <laughs> That's all I can, uh, all I can say, say about that. But um, you said something about uh, the difference between symbol and metaphor, and I think um, I got lost in that moment. My connection was um, uh, disrupted. No, it's between symbol and the um, and the allegory, and I don't know what metaphor where metaphor falls. It according to Amre uh -huh. Gorbin, allegory you can have lots of allegories to the same thing. The symbol is the, the something which attached, so to speak, the symbol is the exoteric which attached to the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. cannot really separate it. So in a way, the, the, you don't want to break it. And that's where you have the esoteric and the exoteric attached. Mm -hmm. And I, no, I, I didn't expect you to not to, to reread the novel or whatever, but I think the minute you start explaining a novel, uh -huh. you are getting into philosophy rather into the novel rather into literature. And I think that's where the borderline, I mean, our experience of literature is so unique and so ours, and it's really a phenomenology of, I mean, the experience that we go through. And that's really the esoteric, I think, and that's what the amazing things that you can do there. But the minute I think you start um, explaining what it is, you know, and you are getting into philosophy. So I think there is some line maybe that you, between philosophy and the novel, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, that, that is, I think, a broader question. Uh, I think the line is not as strict as, as that. <laughs> I think, um, even, I would say even the novel is philosophy, even the novel expresses something, it, do, it uses different uh, ways to do it. And even my speech or my article or something theoretical actually is very much loaded with images and with uh, all kind of, if you like, the unsayable. So there is an aspect of that as well. So I think it's maybe a question of spectrum or really, yeah, I would say genres basically using different, but uh, thanks for that. I think uh, the distinction between symbol, allegory, metaphor, I think that that's something that again, is a very uh, rich angle to look at uh, the novel. Yeah, thank you, Alina and uh, Leah. Uh, Sean would like to add something to this quickly. I was just messaging um, Jordan to say, could I please intervene on this? Um, just with regard to metaphor, and I'm sure Andrew, who's actually a, a massive expert on this, is going to have things to say about this. But um, I think, you know, when it comes to, to doing philosophy in a way that isn't philosophy, um, metaphor is absolutely hugely important. When you look at the etymology of, of metaphor, it's metaphor in. It means to transgress, to carry across. Mm -hmm. um, Darida talks about philosophy as in fact actually riven with metaphor. In mm -hmm. fact, he says that it's a metaphor all the way down, that all of the kind of core philosophical concepts that we think of are mm -hmm. in fact metaphors, it's just that philosophy denies that fact um, to itself. And so I think, you know, when we're trying to engage traditions that are not going to claim this, again, quite fictional genealogy to yeah, the yeah. corpus, then we have to recognize that the novel is an absolutely valuable and um, insightful text for doing philosophy otherwise, of doing that work of transgression, yeah. of moving across those boundaries that are so kind of disciplinarily policed, but need not be because philosophy is in denial of its own history and its own reliance on those literary traditions that it wishes to distance itself from because it says that those muddy the waters, that that makes things ambiguous, that the, that the truth can't really be conceived, that fiction doesn't carry truth. We can see from the novel that you presented today that the truth runs through it like an everlasting river, right? It, it's this beautiful kind of message of, of truth that's running the way through it, expressing itself in the way that truth can only ever be expressed 
which is always in many, many different ways, in a multiplicity of ways. There's no one truth. There's these many ways of doing it. And, and if we don't have metaphor, then, then the truth cannot be expressed. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. <clears throat> I think you expressed it very beautifully. I will only add to that that um, the traditions of thought in other genres, what we call literature, for instance, or poetry, they are even more prominent in other cultures than European ones. And once you um, start what you call this policing the, the, the boundaries, and you start approaching these non-European cultures with, with that idea of philosophy in mind, you may easily um, end up with some deeply, I would say, racist um, colonial perceptions of other cultures as not having philosophy as being collectively whatever. So, I mean, we've seen it all in African philosophy. So I think that um, in the case of non-Western philosophies in particular, non-European philosophies in particular, uh, the, the interrogation of the literary texts or the fictional, uh, poetic, non-theoretical texts is perhaps even more relevant than in the case of European cultures where nobody actually doubts the existence of uh, uh, philosophical ideas. So I think that's, <clears throat> that's sort of what drives my, um, my search or my, my, my set, basically this, this wall of word, this search for texts and interrogation of texts that are in other genres than non-fictional prose. Yes, thank you very much on it. Uh, on this, uh, I want to quickly make sure, uh, Andrew, since you, this is also your area, do you want to comment on that quickly? I, I think Sean said it uh, <laughs> better than I could. I'll All defer right. to Elvis, and yeah, go in a minute. All right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I think as philosophers, we basically now have that um, ethical duties to break these binaries about philosophy and literature, philosophy and music, philosophy and symbols, and so on and so forth. And, and we, we need to keep doing that. And it's beautiful how you've done that with this novel. So I'm basically dragging you back, um, <laughs> Elena, um, Elena, to this issue of um, translation. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can, you can really run from it. <laughs> and um, if, the, if, the, um, if the only way to get access to the... Um, situatedness of that text, the, the, the metaphysical realities of that text, the ontological commitments of the novel um, is through the original text. What happens if I cannot read the original text? How then do I really get access to the um, uh, rich, you know, metaphysical contents or ontological, con ontological commitments in the text. I, this is a huge frustration for me as an African who would, for example, want to um, uh, translate a particular uh, concept in my language and write it in an article or in a book in English. And, and it's a huge struggle because there are these, as you show in the novel, there are these colonial, um, translations already existing. Um, for example, the word the word in my language that has been translated to truth does not in any way even have truth as a concept. Uh, the actual literal translation will be the substance of a talk, the substance of a talk, and that brings in a lot of picture. You know, so how do I really then um, reach the true content, the metaphysical commitments of this text, if I can't read the language, I, I, yeah, I, I don't expect you have a, like a solid answer for it, but at least give it an attempt. Thank you. Um, um, so I studied philosophy in the Czech Republic in the 1990s and Actually, Heidanek was one of my uh, teachers, but not the main one. But um, when we started studying philosophy, we were told, as, a, as philosophers, you must always go to the originals. You always must work with the originals. And as a, so you have to understand the era, right? It was an era just after the 
revolution, so the overcoming of communism. It was an era when these philosophers who were then dissident and mostly worked as um, night porters or they worked in breweries uh, as porters, whatever. So they, they now had the opportunity to go and teach. So these philosophers came with um, what they had been doing their whole life, which is reading texts in languages they did not know or did not speak too well, sort of struggling with originals. And I remember we were doing, well, we had to do uh, two foreign languages, foreign meaning um, English, French, and uh, like world languages, and then two uh, languages which were Latin and ancient Greek. And with a few lessons of ancient Greek, we were sat in a class and the, the teacher started reading Aristotle with us in Greek. So, you know, my experience and my take on it is always learn the language. Now, of course, um, and why am I saying this is a specific era? I mean, at that time, people still had that kind of mentality and the time to learn languages and to actually go to the originals. But these days, if you have a BA degree where you need to teach students philosophy, Quickly, quickly, uh, in three years, four years, uh, obviously you have no choice but work with translations. People also uh, are in a different situation and there are also different ways to access originals. There is a lot of uh, machine translators and so on, which all can help. Um, generally, uh, there is a whole discipline of translation studies, which gives you the various possibilities how to translate, how to work with translation. Of course, translations always depend on the target audience and they depend on your ideology. They depend on, on many things. So if you want to read for pleasure, you know, you can be a bit free perhaps. If you want to read for uh, the philosophical content, then the best you can do is always have a lot of footnotes and uh, some kind of interpretive um, um, repertoire, uh, sorry, interpretive um, inventory, <clears throat> so to speak, that goes with the translation. Um, it's not a kind of easy or straightforward answer, and I don't think there is a real solution to uh, Africa's two to three thousand languages, right? You will never learn three thousand languages. Um, so in, at some point you always hit the wall, <laughs> but um, I still think that uh, maybe the, the, the task is not as, as, as huge as it appears because you people normally select certain texts that they work with, certain traditions. But I think there is no way to run away from the original, basically, that's the bottom line. Uh, whether through uh, machine translations, through people who help you with it, through um, annotations and footnotes, I think that would be my suggestion, really. But I appreciate totally the difficulty to translate, for example, what you say about truth. I think the only thing you can do is basically explain it, yeah? basically do a footnote or write an article about it as Weredu has done for so many concepts, which I think is actually a fascinating topic in itself, how these concepts are translated. There is a, a dictionary of the, the untranslatables by uh, Barbara Cassin. It has also been translated into, uh, or rather untranslated into English by Emily Apter. And it precisely is based on the fact that a theory, especially theory, cannot be translated. You just have concepts that have their histories and that have their um, genealogies. They exist, they impact deeply what we are doing and they cannot be translated. Mm. And even better, they become metaphorical and then, <laughs> then we are lost completely. Thank Sorry. you. I Thank you very Thank much. You. And um, yeah, I'm going to take uh, Benedetta because her hand was up <laughs> earlier than yours, Andrew, and then down. No, but now back up again. So, Benedetta, feel free to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bern. Sorry, Andrew. I'll be quick. No, I just I popped up again with this question of translation. This is just a comment. Perhaps some things are lived before they're even translated. So, mm -hmm. I think to focus so much also on the verbal because these experiences somehow we we do live them we live theories of other parts of the world perhaps before we even grasp them theoretically mm -hmm. um but my question to your presentation Alan I don't know this is just something that interests me very much because I was so interested in that debate in African philosophy about 
dualism being a kind of Western, kind of a Western philosophical product, right? This is, there's such a strong, it's of course a debate in African philosophy, it's not agreed by all scholars, but there's a very prominent uh, orientation in the field that really insists on this fact. And of course your presentation kind of really challenges this. We, we see uh, a very important dualism arising. Uh, I don't know if you care to classify this necessarily as African philosophy, if this is a label that's so important, but for me, it does kind of really have a voice in this debate. Um, of course, you linked it to this kind of non-objective representation. So of course, it's a different kind of dualism than the one that's being critiqued. But still, I wonder, yes, if there's, if, if you would, yeah, if you would cast this as challenging also this binary reading of philosophical mm -hmm. traditions. <clears throat> Actually, I asked the very same question to Emiliano. <laughs> And there was another student in the uh, in the class back then who asked Emiliano. Emiliano um, is a colleague from from our team who gave a lecture on um, precisely on wall of poetry, basically Sufi wall of poetry and the dualism present in in that poetry. <clears throat> and he was asked um, by one of the students, and I followed up basically exactly the same question. You know, so if Sufi thought as present in poetry, and he quoted a lot of examples starting actually from the Quran and then in Wall of Poetry. Um, it is very prominently structured in these dualities, dualisms, binaries, however you call it, or dichotomies, he called it dichotomies. And um, I think that I would actually say yes to your question. I think it does challenge uh, the challenge to dualism that has been posed by um, certain thinkers in African philosophy. Um, you can always, of course, say this is one particular tradition. This is the Islamic tradition, which is present in certain areas, not in others. So you can always say perhaps there is a prevalence of, a, I don't know, a, three-way logic in other areas. There is a presence of um, some kind of merging of opposites or um, however it is called or contextual reading of, uh, of uh, logic and of, uh, of realities. But I do think that um, in a way it, it, it does present a certain challenge to that thinking. So definitely, and it's also my my sort of um, interrogation of how far this kind of binary thinking and and of course you know if we speak of dualism in Western philosophy there is a very specific dualism of the body and the soul if you like the kind of Cartesian dualism so perhaps we need to leave that aside for the time being but um, I do think that this kind of binary thinking of dividing things on two sides is something that appears very um very common if not universal uh, even in you know even in the way we structure language even in the way we uh, use uh, concepts there is always that kind of you have something and then you make two out of it which are more or less opposite or different i don't know if it answers your question but i'm, I'm also very struck by it actually thank you yeah, I can understand that you are getting asked very interesting, but also pretty, pretty intense questions. <laughs> so I think you're holding up very nicely. All right, let's see what Elvis, uh, what what Andrew has to offer now. Um, right, I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, for your, your talk. Uh, the novel is a new novel to me, so it's very interesting, and I'm looking forward to reading it now on summer holidays. Um, Super quickly, so I, one of the ways I understand metaphor is it can at times be a vicious circle. And I really saw that in the, how you were explaining it. And I was actually really struck by the idea of mirroring versus aping. Uh, there were moments when you were, the examples you were giving about mirroring, it's something that happens to us. And then aping is something we do. And that's the vicious circle of metaphor, right? We were born into speaking metaphors before we even understand their metaphors. Mm -hmm. And yet we use them in the same way the gorillas begin to viciously use them. So there's this vicious circle of something happening to us and then doing it to others. And um, 
you know, that, that's what Al-Farabi does when he translates Aristotle's poetics into Arabic. He says, Aristotle has this idea of, of, of a metaphor being you borrow something to give something a new meaning. But Al-Farabi says he doesn't go far enough. He doesn't realize that it's an endless cycle of borrowing is what metaphor is. And I, I tend to agree with Al-Farabi about that. So the point of my question, um, Elena, is does the novel give an exit strategy to this endless loop that we might have? Question one. Question two can metaphor always work in the same way in this because because as Benedetta just pointed out we have different experiences and so can we talk about how metaphor always works with our cognition but what about you know the, the lived reality of colonial experience for example does metaphor work in a different way in that circumstance than it might in say my experience of metaphor who's never had a colonial experience those are my two questions oh, oh. oh big questions <laughs> Um, I got a little bit distracted while you were speaking by the chat. Uh, so uh, uh, the um, vicious circle that you are speaking about, um, if I, first of all, I wanted to say uh, something about the mirroring. In the novel, it's not something that happens to us. It is something that we actively I think you cut out again. Uh, Alina, can you still hear us? Uh, let's give it a moment. Not be sure. back. That's be back. Yeah, yeah. This, this is such a, a good, and I actually do we have to quite a look in the word, yeah. um, and even the etymology of the word. Oh, there you are, uh, Alina. Okay, Alina. It's quite iconic. It's a it's a good good shot in mixed <laughs> thinking. Yes. <laughs> Let's just give her a moment. Yeah. Oh, now she saw that, but it, that happened a second before, so she will be back in a second. Um, in the meantime, though, I mean, uh, um, Andrew, why don't you tell her? Ah, here she is. Okay. Ah, there you are. I don't know what is happening. There must be some kind of evil demon playing with <laughs> my connection. I normally have a very stable connection here in this uh, location. My apologies for that. Uh, um, don't worry. And we unfortunately lost you pretty much at the beginning of your answer. So if you oh. be so kind to, to repeat okay. that, thank you. Oh, I've been talking for five minutes. <laughs> no, um, thanks for the two questions. I think they are really very rich. Um, and uh, I think I started by saying that even the mirroring is an active, um, is an active act in the novel because uh, you need to look in the mirror. I think we lost her again. I think I was lost again for a second. We got you. We hear you. We hear you now. Maybe turn off the camera, Elena. Okay. Uh... So yeah. the last thing we heard was uh, when you said that it is uh, looking in the mirror as an active action yes. by ourselves. Yes. yes, I think the connection is back now. Let me try with the camera as well. Yeah. So um, yeah. So um, in a way, um, I keep in a way I keep thinking myself whether there is this kind of categorical difference between mirroring and aping. Uh, mirroring seems to be much more complex in the novel. There are many more and less easily um, interpretable uh, instances of it. Um, now, can you please remind me of the question you spoke of the circle, of the vicious circle? Um, I, I think you've actually clarified for me that I was misunderstanding the nature of mirroring. I was just saying that metaphors can be tricky because we're born into them we find ourselves speaking them and yet we do speak them and carry out violence with them and so i was just that was the vicious circle of we find ourselves speaking them and yet we also have intentionality when we speak them mm. yes yes i think we are locked into metaphors and there is very little we can do about it <laughs> uh, as the cognitive linguists have have said and the second question, sorry, I, I'm now a bit. Yeah, no, it's okay. I think the second question is more pertinent, which is 
we've discussed metaphor in a very abstract way, which I really am, uh, like, but I'm wondering, is it the case that we can just say metaphor happens in the same way in all experiences, or does metaphor happen differently based on experiences such as colonial violence? Yeah, that's an excellent question. <clears throat> and I don't think I have an answer to that because I only have one side of the experience, right? I can only speak of uh, my own experience of metaphors. Uh, perhaps I can say a few things about the cultural traditions in which these metaphors are used. So for instance, um, there is a very explicit um, talking about the Swahili tradition, which is actually linked to Islam as well, to the Sufi uh, tradition of thought. Uh, there is a um, way of seeing poetry as speaking in metaphors. Good poetry speaks in metaphors and it, it should not express too much what they mean. It should simply use the metaphors. And then there is the activity of the listener to unravel the metaphors. Um, again, if I ref reference Emiliano Minerva on the wall of poetry, um, he mentioned several instances where the poetry actually first introduced the metaphor and then explained it. So there is also like the poem itself actually gives you the metaphor and then uh, sort of expands on it. Um, I'm not sure if it answers your question, I think not, but perhaps I'll think more about it and come back to it at a later point. But it's, I think it's a very deep question. It's a very Thanks. good answer. Thank you so much for the answer. I think it's really good actually, more profound than you realize, because I think it, it hints at the fact that, you know, we might have to look at inst specific instances to even begin to answer that question. And so thank you for that, yeah. But maybe I can add one more thing. <clears throat> I think um, what for me is actually the starting point for this analysis of the novel is the perception that the world is, if you like, fake, right? It's deceptive. So the world itself prompts our interpretation. The world is a, like a network of signs that mean something. So there is like a semiotics basically embedded in existence itself. And perhaps that could be um, and the entry point into understanding metaphor. So metaphor always is a kind of transfer of meaning to something else. Another, the, signif the, the, the signified has another, the signified becomes another signifier of another signified. So I think this kind of transfer of meaning perhaps is particularly uh, prominent in uh, cultures that depart from this understanding of the world as being um, being out there to interpret, being being a sign, being something to read. Thank you very much. Um, let me quickly see. Because, yeah. Oh, Helen had just to to go already. So that would mean yeah, Sean. Just one very sort of quick point on this question of of. <clears throat> and I've sort of been putting something in the chat, but actually metaphor etymologically is, is associated with, with matter, um, with the, the, the transfer of matter from one place to the other or the transformation of matter from one thing to another. And I think that, you know, when we get caught up in, in language, which of course is always already metaphorical, it's always standing in for the things themselves. Mm -hmm. We need to recall that connection to perhaps not the world, but the worlding. And I think that's where I appreciated Leah's um, intervention is, you know, mm -hmm. there is a kind of a Heideggerian sense here that, that we are worlded in particular ways and we have things to hand and we do what we can with them to shape them into some kind of, of truth. Um, but that truth itself is a very kind of tenuous, sometimes deceptive, sometimes kind of on the mark, never final moment. And I think that's why the focus on literature is actually, actually so valuable because um, we get moments of newness in, and, and novelty. And I'm getting increasingly interested in how novelty connected to the novel um, mm. arises in the way that we think, especially when we're looking at the kind of colonial, post-colonial, decolonial movement. It's, it's how do we think in new ways? How do we allow newness to arrive in the way that, you know, Fanon also mm. tries mm. to 
part as the kind of decolonial moment of um, you know breaking with that past. And I think literature is one of those remarkable moments where newness arrives, but so is the kind of craft of the hand with the matter that we have to hand. And I think as philosophers, we too often forget, um, again, sorry to, to reference study that, but you know, the hands that we have in front of us and the things that our hands uh, can do or the things that our eyes see or touch or, or so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So um, I'm not quite sure where I was going with that, but I just kind of wanted to, to reinforce the idea that metaphor is always connected to matter, to materiality, to the, to the world. Deceptive, undeceptive, new, not new, things that we can make of it. And that there's a kind of hope, I think, in that. Mm. Thanks. Mm. Thank you. All right. Uh, um, Andrew, you want to follow up on that? Um, I Sorry, we probably should all go. I do apologize. <laughs> Just as a final comment to Sean's point, though, I think it's interesting. I, I completely agree that there's a meta etymological connection to matter. However, that's also um, linked to the fact that uh, for Aristotle, and particularly with the translation into Latin with Cicero, the, the, the measure of a good metaphor and political rhetoric becomes that which accurately represents matter. And so I think there can be a dark side to that too, that is often seen in the history of the rhetorical schools that, that get embedded into kind of European aristocratic culture after the fall of the Roman Empire. So it's just also a reminder of the dark side of metaphor connecting to matter. You know, it needs to be truthful and truthful is measured against, um, you know, the world. That's it, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah, it is indeed a very strange thing with the metaphors that um, we, on the one hand, uh, use them a lot. And on the other hand, at least within Western thought, there seems to be an overall um, mistrust towards metaphors. And there seems to be an overall desire of always translating into what they actually mean, instead of accepting them that their actual meaning is probably the expression of our existential situation as living uh, beings who make use of metaphorical language, not as a, as a device of language on a on a secondary on a on a on a, uh, a degenerate version of of um, language, but as an original way to express ourselves. And I think it's it's very interesting what uh, Sean brought up with the newness because there's a there's quite a deep distrust uh, towards newness within Western thought. I think probably coming mainly from Augustine's fight against curiosity, which was interestingly enough massively attacked by one of the main proponents of the philosophy of uh, metaphor, which is Hans Blumenberg. And he, he massively tried to fight this, this hatred of Augustine towards curiositas. So that, that, that's a very interesting twist. Sorry for abusing the privilege of moderating to force that in. So I'm giving it back to, to Elvis. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, and Thank you. Uh, Elvis, please say your final words. Thank you. That was a great discussion. Thank you so much. I have a lot to think of, I have to say. I tend to think slowly. It will sort of go around in my head and perhaps there'll be a ne next lecture at some point about metaphors, culturally specific uses of metaphors. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Elena. Um, you sort of um, moved us to think a lot <laughs> um, during the talk. If this was a writing retreat, perhaps, or we'll come out with some very interesting articles at the long run. Um, the questions were obviously not ending, so which means that uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed your, your lecture and we are grateful for it. And we are happy that we'll be able to have it to, to watch um, after now and then reflect more on it and be able to uh, tie to a lot of uh, issues. You know, um, We talk about truth um, currently, doing a paper on cognition and how slippery it can be when you talk about it from an individual perspective. And, and yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of synergies here, here and there. So thank you so very much um, for um, the talk and you're always part of us and we look forward to yet another time where, where we can have you, perhaps maybe in person in the future. Um, so uh, thank you all for attending as well and um, have a lovely weekend, everyone.
Thank you so much. I've seen you've just shared the link to my next lecture, <laughs> which is in the Gesellschaft für Interkulturelle Philosophie. Uh, I'll be speaking about language as well, about uh, being, to be uh, or not to be, about um, I think ontology, we'll be ontology be without being, if, it, if it's possible. So it will also yeah. somehow come back to the world, but I will not spoil um, the lecture for you <laughs> by giving it to you right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. As ever, just greetings to all the students. Experience. Yeah, I'll stop it. Great to see you.